Today's message is entitled, The Rejection and Acceptance of the Jews. I don't know if any of you have ever been to Rome. Um, I did not know this was there. I was there whew, 20 years ago. I didn't know this was there. This is called the Arch of Titus. Um, it's actually built in 80 AD, I think. A long time ago. It's one of the oldest pieces. Somehow it's still there. After all the times that Rome has been sacked, the Arch of Titus is still there. And it was erected because of one of the greatest victories that Rome ever won. It was against the Jews. This is one of the reliefs there, one of the frescoes. It's, you see the menorah there. I don't know what those other video cameras are they're carrying. If anyone else does, I'd love to. But this is a remembrance of them because it was such an incredibly hard-fought victory for the Romans to take over Jerusalem. If I take it back, in 66 AD, the Jews were in revolt again. And um, Nero was the emperor. Nero was the one that Paul said we're supposed to submit to, right? One of the most horrible emperors there's ever been. And the Jews were not submitting to Emperor Nero. And so he sent his general Vespasian in to put down the rebellion. And he moved from city to city, reducing every single one of them. And uh, by the time he got to Jerusalem, he had been made emperor himself. Nero was dead. Vespasian went to Rome to take over the empire, and he left his son Titus to finish the job. He had one job, Jerusalem. You got to do a good job, son. I'm leaving you with one thing to do. I took care of the rest of the country. You take care of Jerusalem. And it was my privilege to be able to study out this siege, and I can't tell you everything that happened, um, but it was an amazing encounter. This is better than uh, Clark versus Rommel. This is better than Scipio versus Hannibal. This is one of the most amazing two generals. It was Titus versus Simon. And um, the amazing things that happened during this siege, both very courageous, very geniuses, both of them, military geniuses, and to watch how they, how they maneuvered against each other. Um, as the Romans, who were unparalleled in the field, nobody challenged the Romans in the field. The only time you ever took a shot at the Romans was from behind a wall. And um, that's what was always happening. They were always sieging cities. This was their job. They were really good at it. But as the Romans were coming to surround Jerusalem, what, of course, did the Jews do? They made a sally out of the city and attacked the Romans in the open field. And they actually drove them off. This hadn't happened in an awful long time. The courage and the valor of the Jews drove the Romans off, and Titus had to come in with his cavalry to save his troops. And this happened over and over during the siege that the, that the Jews would leave the city and attack the Romans. And Titus had to come in with great courage with his own bodyguard and save his troops. There were defensive sorties. There were um, uh, sappers. Usually, uh, if you know what a sapper is, it's, it's the tunnelers that the attackers will dig underneath the wall to try to undermine the wall and make it fall down. Or they can come up in the city and attack the city from the inside. Well, the Jews had their own sappers. I've never heard of this in a siege before, but the Jews dug underneath their own wall, and they dug underneath the siege works of the Romans that were outside the wall, and they lit their supports on fire, and all their siege works collapsed and burst into flame. And they destroyed the Roman siege works. There was a time when the Romans had broken through the second wall of the city. There were three different walls of defense. When they broke through the second wall of the city, and they were entering the second wall, and there was silence. There's eerie silence. Can you imagine after three months of sieging and you enter the city and you see nothing? And their skin began to crawl. And all of a sudden, after some thousands had entered the city, the Jews began to attack them from all sides. And the hole in the wall was so small that the Romans couldn't escape. And they were trapped in the city. And they were nearly annihilated. And some of them were able to actually escape. But then the Jews not only drove the Romans out of the city, but they themselves made a sortie out the same hole and attacked the Romans and drove them away. And they held the Romans off long enough for them to rebuild the wall while they're under siege. The Jews were making a masterful defense of the city, and, and the Romans were disheartened so many times. But it, they were destroyed from within. I believe that that siege would have held in 70 AD, that siege would have held had it not been for the betrayal, the infighting that was going on in the city. In fact, 
there was a time when the food stores were destroyed by the Jews because they felt that if we reach the starvation point, then we're going to be desperate enough to fight. They felt like some of their soldiers weren't fighting hard enough. So they said, let's destroy the food so that we have to win right now. And these are the kinds of things. It was a terrible idea because the siege happened four days after Passover. The city was crowded, not only with refugees, but with the people who were celebrating the Passover. The city was crammed full of people. And for three months, they were on starvation mode. And they, and they still did not fall until the Temple Mount was invaded. And they made a stand in the courtyard. They were driving the Romans out of the courtyard of the temple when the temple, mount, the temple wall was, was already broken down. And um, they kept up the defending of the city until the daily sacrifice ran out. They finally ran out of lambs. They offered a morning and an evening sacrifice throughout the entire siege, even while they were starving. They offered a morning and evening sacrifice, and they ran out of lambs. And it was shortly after that that the city was, the temple was taken. The temple was burned, and the city was taken. It's just a terrible thing to think about how horrible this was. In fact, what happened to the people there in Jerusalem was so bad that when Jesus prophesied in Matthew 24 about the end times, about the abomination of desolation standing in the temple, about when you see that, flee to the hills, about uh, a piece of bread will buy a bag of gold. One is taken and the other is left. There's a legitimate dispute. Is he talking about 70 AD when this happened to Jerusalem? Or is he talking about the end times? And probably what happened to Jerusalem in those days is a picture of the apocalypse. Because they were crucified until the Romans ran out of wood. That's what they did with the survivors. They ran out of wood for their siege engines because they were using so much of it for crosses. A piece of bread will buy a bag of gold. In the city, gold wasn't worth much because the gold never disappeared, but the bread did. The gold kept passing round and round, and it was still there. So any Jews that were trying to escape, they would swallow the gold. And can you imagine the butchery that happened when it was found out that that's what was happening, when they went out to the Romans and tried to surrender the living and the dead? They were not able to save their gold. That's why I'm in farming, by the way. <laughs> because livestock is the oldest form of wealth, and you can always eat it. So all y'all, when your gold is worthless, come to me. <laughs> I am actually preparing somewhat for that day. The Jews were destined for destruction. We've never seen this kind of destruction that happened to Jerusalem. And I want to take you back. Luke 23, 1 through 21. This is what happened when Jesus was on trial. Okay, he had already been to the Sanhedrin. They would already said, we, we have decided to put this person to death. This is Jesus. And the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, we have found this man subverting our nation. This is very important. They're saying he opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Messiah, a king. The accusation against Jesus was that he is an insurrectionist. He's a rebel. He's raising his fist against Rome. So Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus very humbly said, you say Whatever you say goes. Jesus recognized Pilate's authority in Jerusalem. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests in the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted he stirs up people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. And I'm taking on a few verses there where Jesus was sent to Herod. And we'll pick it up again here where he comes back to Pilate. And Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers of the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. And I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither is Herod, for he sent me back to, him back to us, as you can see. So the authorities of the day, the Hebrew authority, which was Herod, which is, by the way, Herod's, was that Herod's son or grandson who was trying to kill, grandfather or father that was trying to kill Jesus, looking for Jesus to kill him. And here he is, Herod, the descendant. Jesus is standing right in front of him. And he finds no basis for any charge of rebellion. He says, you're not a threat to me. You can go free. He has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and release him, says Pilate. 
But the whole crowd shouted, away with this man. Release Barabbas to us. Here I want you to see this point. Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. The very thing that they were accusing Jesus of being, which he wasn't, Barabbas was. And they had Barabbas released. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. We're going to skip over to continue this story in Matthew. Matthew 27, 24 and 26. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but instead an uproar was starting, he took water, washed his hands in front of the crowd, said, I am innocent of this man's blood. It is your responsibility. And all the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. I want you to get this line. This is a very significant piece of scripture that our church doesn't like to talk about very much because we are for Israel and we love Israel. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. But this did happen. They said his blood is on us and on our children. This line is so significant to the Jewish history that when Mel Gibson was making that movie, The Passion, he submitted it to the Catholic, Protestant, and Jewish authorities to say, do you guys have any problem with what's, what I'd like to do with this movie? And the Jews said, um, there's this one line when all the Jews are raising their hand and say, let his blood be on us and our children. We don't want that in the movie. And so you won't see it because he deferred to the Jews because they realized that this line has been used against them for 2,000 years. The Crusades happened and they were using this line, the pogroms, the holocaust, much of the persecution that's happening to the Jews today, even the church at times. I was talking to a guy who was going to Bible school, and he is a pastor now, and we were just talking about witnessing, and I said, you know, if, which you never do have a choice, but let's say you're talking to a, you got a choice, a Jew or a Gentile. I said, I'd rather see the Jew witness to him and see him get saved. And the guy said, not me. No way, not in a million years. He said, the Jews killed Jesus. This line is still used against the Jews today. The Jews chose their path of rebellion. They chose to reject the authority, the gift that God had given them, accuse him of insurrection, and instead they wanted freed Barabbas, who was an insurrectionist. They chose their path of rebellion. I'd like to submit to you that that curse has been fulfilled. That that curse no longer applies to the Jews today because of what happened to Jerusalem in 70 AD. If you remember there, it says, His blood is on us and on our children. That's not, none of them who are alive today are their children. How many generations removed? This said, His blood is on us and on our children. Now, that's a little bit of a stretch. Let's look at Matthew 23. He says, woe to you, teacher. This is Jesus speaking before, beforehand, actually between the triumphal entry and the crucifixion. He's saying, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees. You hypocrites, you build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Go ahead then and complete what your ancestors started. Jesus knew what they were about to do. You snakes, you brood of vipers. How will you escape being condemned to hell? Therefore, I'm sending you prophets and sages, teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth. From the blood of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. This is 400 years previous. We are saying you murdered him. Truly I tell you, all this will come on this generation. Jerusalem was destroyed some 40 years after Jesus said this. It happened to them and to their children. My assertion to you is that that curse has been fulfilled. And our attitude now can be different towards the Jews. He continued, he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather you your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And you were not willing. You can just picture Jesus weeping. This is God's heart for Israel. His heart is not one of condemnation. But he's begging them to come to him. Look, your house is left to you desolate. 
This is what happened in 70 AD. It was nothing left of Jerusalem. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What does that remind you of? Blessed is he. Have we heard that before? That was during the triumphal entry. That was when Jesus came and was, it was, was partied, was, was feted. This is, this is what they were waiting for. They were shouting. They were shouting. Right, Jeff? Blessed is he who comes to Baruch HaBab Hashem. Yoah. They were shouting it, waving palm branches. Look at all this. All right, picture this scene. And we're going to go back in Psalm 118. This is what they were thinking when they were doing all this. When they said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, they knew their Old Testament, and this is what they were thinking, Psalm 118. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die but live. This is Jesus, right? I will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely. He has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of God, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. And that's where Jesus went, directly into the temple. And drove out all the money changers. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his love endures forever. He came in peace, riding on a donkey. There's a reason he said the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered. It's because they had just brought him in as a king into Jerusalem and were fulfilling these lines from Zechariah, reminding them that they had killed the very man that they were quoting. Zechariah 9, 9 through 10 says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter, is Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly, riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. When a king came riding on a donkey, that meant the people had nothing to fear. He was coming in peace. There were several times in the Old Testament that I'm, as I'm studying this, you remember, uh, Gideon had 70 sons, and they all rode mules, and that meant that the nation was at peace. And then there's other times. One I want to remind you of is Solomon. When he was made king, he was riding the king's mule. And the first time I read that, I thought, this is the best he can do? He's got a mule? But it's because the nation is at peace that he rode a mule through. And that was telling everybody, everything is wonderful. You can rest. I'm not coming to try to take this nation over. It is already at peace. Jesus came riding a mule to demonstrate that he was not coming in war. That he was a peaceful king. He was not an insurrectionist. Everything he had done up to this point was to prove to the people that he's not in rebellion against authority. They said he's telling people not to pay taxes to Caesar. What do we know of Jesus? When, they showed, when someone asked him, should we pay taxes to Caesar? He said, look at a coin. Whose inscription is on it? Caesar's. All right, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God what is God's. Even in the garden, some days before this, he had, been, he had an opportunity to begin an insurrection. Right, The swords had already come out. The fighting had begun. And Jesus stopped it and healed the one who had been hurt. Jesus used every opportunity. He was submissive to Pilate. Herod and Pilate did not find any fault in him. In fact, he was so, he was so much not a threat that when he was crucified, the Romans gave him the title of king. They said, king of the Jews. Doesn't, doesn't bother us. You can call him king. We're fine. The Jews were, given, were taught to submit to authority from Jeremiah, who taught them to submit to the Babylonians, to Jesus, to Paul, who taught them to submit to Nero. Every one of them said, it doesn't matter how bad it is, it is not our responsibility to rebel. And I feel like doing that once in a while. I have guns in my house not just to protect me from 
robbers. But in case anything might, and then, so I need to remind myself once in a while, submit to those in authority. No matter how hot it gets, we have the Declaration of Independence, which is a little different, but that's a, it's a different sermon. That's next week. Oh, good. Awesome. Well, I'll look forward to it. In fact, because of Jesus, the Jews shouted, the Jewish leadership shouted for the first time, we have no king but Caesar. This is something that never would have happened at any point in history. For the Jews to shout, we have no king but Caesar. And because they wanted Jesus dead so bad, he actually did not bring rebellion to Israel. He brought peace to Israel. But remember, they had made their choice. Because of that line, may his blood be on us and our children, there's a doctrine sprung up called replacement theology. It says that, G- that God is done with the Jews. They rejected their Messiah, and God has now moved on to the Gentiles. In fact, uh, there's some things that Paul says, which is, uh, I've, I've wiped my feet of the, of the Jews. They're rejecting God's word. I'm now an apostle to the Gentiles. And this cannot be our attitude. Because we don't teach that God is done with Israel. Some scripture that, that they will use often with this is, is, uh, comes from Isaiah 6, 8 through 10. Now this you always hear when a missionary comes into town. He says, or when someone says, I, I feel like I want to be a missionary. I feel called. I heard the voice of the sovereign master say, whom will I send and who will go on our behalf? I answered, here am I. Send me. And that's wonderful. If a person is willing to do whatever God needs done, send me. But this next few verses you almost never hear. He said, go and tell these people, listen continually, but don't understand. Look continually, but don't perceive. Make the hearts of these people calloused. Make their ears deaf and their eyes blind. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and their hearts might understand, and they might repent and be healed. And that's something that God did not want at this time. We don't understand this. I don't understand it. And that's why we... When someone says, I'll go, I'll go preach to the lost, let's just forget those next few verses. But these are here, and they're again and again and again in the New Testament. This is one of the most repeated passages of Scripture. Make their eyes blind. The Jews' eyes have been blinded. Their ears have been stopped up. And they have not been allowed to receive the message that was given. And so it's tempting for those of us as Gentiles to say, forget the Jews. They can go to hell. That's what some of Christians, their attitudes are towards the Jews. They rejected the Lord. And this cannot be our attitude. Because we don't teach that God is done with Israel. God has a lot of plans for Israel. Look at Revelation 12, 1 through 6. A great sign appeared in heaven. I'm just going to read this and then we'll talk about who a woman is. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and her head was a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and screaming in labor pain, struggling to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, a huge red dragon that had seven heads and ten horns. And on its head were seven diadems, crowns. Now the dragon's tail swept away a third of the stars in heaven and hurled them to the earth. Then the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child as soon as it was born. So the woman gave birth to a son, a male child, who was going to rule over the nations with an iron rod. Her child was suddenly caught up to God and to his throne, and she was fled into the wilderness where a place had been prepared for her by God so she could be taken care of for 1,260 days. That's three and a half years. That's one of the reasons we know this is during the tribulation. This is the last part of this age. And that woman, there's a few different ways to look at that. Is that the church? Is that Mary? Or is that Israel? Well, let's look right here. It says the woman gave birth to a son, a male child. Is that the church? That's Jesus, right? Who will rule the, over all the nations with an iron rod. It can't be the church. Jesus isn't our son. He's our brother. So we got Israel or, uh, or Mary. So let's go back to this first reference. It says, clothed with the sun and with the moon under her feet, and on her head was a crown of 12 stars. Is this Mary? This goes back to Joseph's dream 
And he said, I saw the sun and the moon and the 12 stars bowing down before me. This is Israel. Israel is in the last times. Look, Revelation 21, 9 through 14, it says, One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven final plagues came and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. So he took me away in the spirit to a huge, majestic mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. And you could say, okay, it's not Israel, but it's just where we live, right? It's still its capital, but it's not Israel anymore. It's just Jerusalem. And the city possesses the glory of God. Its brilliance is like a precious jewel, like a stone of crystal clear jasper. It has massive high wall with 12 gates. <laughs> uh, just thinking about the siege of Jerusalem. They added 30 feet to that wall when they knew the Romans were, were approaching. The entire wall, five kilometers of wall, they added 30 feet to it. <clears throat> a massive high wall, 12 gates, 12 angels at the gates. The names of the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel are written on the gates. The gates are the 12 tribes of Israel. We don't have any option but to say Israel has a future in God's plan. There are three gates on the east side, three on the west, three on the north, three on the south. The wall of the city has 12 foundations, and on them are the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Those guys are all Jewish. The foundation of the city, the gates of the city, it's all Jews. Look here in Revelation 7. This is at the, in the end times again, during the tribulation. It says, do not damage the earth or the sea or the trees until we have put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Now I heard the number of those who were marked with the seal. 144,000 sealed from all the tribes of the people of Israel. God has a plan for these people. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, Benjamin. From all these 12 tribes of Israel, God has, will be sealing 12,000 to be his witnesses to those lost people who are perishing in the last days. Ten of those tribes, we have no idea who they are. And what's more, they have no idea who they are. They're lost tribes. Any Jew you talk to today, if he identifies himself as, or herself as a Jew, they'll say, I'm from the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Levi. Maybe a few from Benjamin. But that's it. You won't find anyone to raise your hand and say, I'm from Reuben. I'm an Aphtalite. I'm from Issachar. I might be wrong on that, but I... As far as I know, those ten tribes are lost. But God knows who they are. God knows things that we don't know. And God has his plan. He has people identified. Have you ever looked at that and said, well, they don't know who they are. And I don't think I'm Jewish. But maybe. You know, you come to that day and you're like, oh, I'm being sealed. Maybe I'm from Gad. Who knows? I don't think I'm a Jew, but you get a little Jew envy once in a while. That will be a tremendous honor for the people who are sealed, the people who find out in that day. Thousands and thousands of people will find out that they are Jewish. There is going to be a cup that they have to drink, a cup of suffering and service, but they will be honored in the kingdom. I just want to point something out fun on this list. I, I just looked at it and said, I wonder how that's arranged. Because, you know, you can, you can say the 12 tribes in a few different ways. So I looked at this. All right, are they going to do Ephraim and Manasseh? Are they going to do Joseph and Levi, or how's, how's this going to end up? They've got Manasseh, so typically you'd look for Ephraim also, because those are the two sons of Joseph, if that tribe is split. But then they've got Joseph there also, and no Ephraim. What that tells you is someone's, something's missing. Someone's missing. Who, can any of you guys, who gets it first? Dan, I heard it. I don't know who, who said it. Dan's missing. You know why? I would love if you could tell me why. I have no idea. Uh, I have a couple ideas, but I know that they're mine, so it's probably not the mind of God. He has his own purposes. The tribe of Dan is missing. That's the kind of stuff that's in Scripture all over the place, and it's just interesting. God knows what he's doing, and he, he's not doing the things that we would expect. He's got a plan. Romans 11, 
This is the Paul who said, I wash my hands of the Jews, I'm going to be an apostle of the Gentiles. And as he's writing to the Romans, he says, I ask again, did they, the Jews, stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. Is that humiliating or what? We are so happy to, be, to belong to God, but realize that one of the chief purposes of salvation coming to us at all is to make Israel jealous. But if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? I am talking to you Gentiles, most of us in this room. Inasmuch as I'm an apostle to the Gentiles, I take pride in my ministry and I hope that I may somehow arise my own people to envy, to save some of them. <laughs> that's, Paul's, that's Paul's goal in ministering to the Gentiles, is to bring envy to the, to the Israelites. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? This is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. Can you imagine something terrible that the Jews did in rejecting Christ? It was the worst thing and has followed them for thousands of years, rejecting Christ. And if something that was that horrible did something as amazing as bringing reconciliation to the world, can you imagine what's going to happen on the day when they accept their Savior? I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until a full number of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. I don't know exactly what that means, but that's what God says. All Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies, enemies of God, right? Not enemies of us. They're enemies of God for your sake. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. It's a lot to follow, and I'm not sure I can the whole time. But this is, just, this is how God's mind works. And it's the height of arrogance and pretension to say, yeah, I see what God was doing there. I get it. I think he's doing a good job. I applaud God for rejecting the Jews for 2,000 years. And it's like, it's like your brother getting a spanking, and you're saying, good job, Dad. Hit him harder. Right? <laughs> you know what's coming next. If you, if you are encouraging the punishment of the Jews. And so we do not participate in that. And when we see the Jews suffering, we mourn with them. Even if it's God's own hand of discipline. Because we know where we stand. We know that it was their disobedience that brought salvation to us. And we need to be humble. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he might have mercy on them all. He said, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, he wasn't talking about the triumphal entry because that had happened already. He was talking about another day. Amen. There will come a day when Jerusalem is surrounded on all sides by her enemies. When Jerusalem is about to give in. When the daily sacrifice has stopped. And they don't know where their salvation is going to come from. And on that day, they will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They are going to see their deliverer, this time on a horse, coming to deliver. Look, it says in Revelation 19, 11 through 16, it says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. And they will say, blessed. They will shout 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They will shout Baruch, Haba, Shem, Yahuwah. Blessed is he. There will come a day when the Jews say, may his blood be on us and on our children. And it will be for deliverance. It will be for forgiveness. Amen. And that's the day we're praying for. That's the day that brings our hope. Who killed Jesus? Raise your hand if you know who killed Jesus. It wasn't the Romans. It wasn't the Jews. If you remember the Passion, the movie, Mel Gibson was making this movie. And he said, I don't want to have any acting part in this movie because I don't want it to be a Mel Gibson movie. But there's one part that I have to do. And he did act in one part. And he said, those have to be my hands. That's the only, only place he appears in that movie. He says, I am the one who nailed Jesus to the cross. I am Barabbas, the rebel who was exchanged for Jesus. This was also that he could show mercy on us. I don't pretend to know the mind of God. I'm just opening scripture, helping us to understand a little bit of what's in there. God is an amazing God. And I'd like to close this message by reading the rest of this Romans 11 passage. It says, Oh, the depth and riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of God? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Oh, Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for the privilege of being counted as your children. We know that uh, you said to the, to the Jews that you are able to raise up out of these stones children of Abraham. And that is us. That you have raised up to be children of Abraham, to walk beside you and with you and for you. And we do not forget those who were the original sons, the vine to, into which we've been grafted. You are the general who understands the entire battle from top to bottom, and we serve you, we just do what we're told, and God, we are so amazed at your wisdom and understanding of everything that's going to happen. We pray that that day would come soon when the Jews raise up, lift up their eyes to heaven, and bless you, and ask for your blood of your precious son Jesus to be on them. The culmination of the age, we ask that it would come soon, Lord, because we want to serve you with everything that we have, and no longer have to submit to ungodly authorities to be able to submit to you as a righteous God. And we ask that you would bring peace. You would come after you have come on your horse to destroy all, everything that stands against you. We desire to live in your peace. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you feel like Barabbas today, you've been in rebellion against God and that you got away with something that he has forgiven you despite your sin and you would like to come and meet and talk and repent we sure hope that we'd like to think that Barabbas came and became a Christian at some point that'd be a wonderful picture but we all as the one who was exchanged for Jesus' life have the opportunity to receive that exchange for us so that his death will not be in vain I hope you've enjoyed this to hear other messages, go to facebook.com forward slash GCF Church or youtube.com forward slash GCF Messages. You may also follow Georgetown Christian Fellowship with our app. Go to either iOS or the Play Store for Android and search for Word Server. That's one word, Word Server and install the free application. There you will get all of our messages, including streaming capabilities.